Hi everyone and welcome back to our video. We are looking at those best practices we can use to support students with disabilities in middle school and high school settings. And we are chatting now about strategies we can use to support students um, in math. So let's start by um, looking at a few things that we can do. Uh, the first strategy that is often successful is allowing students, when possible, to work in partners or in groups. When students are working in partners and groups, that's a great time for you to circulate around the room, offering a lot of support and making sure students are on track and making sure that partners and groups, you know, everyone is doing their fair share to finish the work. Definitely when we break down problems and tasks and assignments into smaller chunks or steps, uh, giving students visual supports for that is often very helpful. In math, we're often looking at a strategy um, where we give students models of problems that have been solved already that are the same type as what they are doing. So they can look at that model and follow it step by step to see um, where they need to go to solve the problem they have in front of them. And that's often called worked problems. Also providing students access to manipulatives, whether those are physical manipulatives in a face-to-face -face instruction or providing them with access to virtual manipulatives that they could use um, when you're on campus or if you're teaching remotely, uh, those virtual manipulatives can be really beneficial to students to make sure that they are able to see that problem being solved is often uh, super important. When we're supporting students, we sometimes see some significant behaviors. And there are two um, basic groups of behaviors that we see. Sometimes we see um, what, like what we see here with this volcano, those um, erupting behaviors, which we call externalizing behaviors. Sometimes they seem to come out of nowhere and students just erupt in anger. Um, and sometimes you see that slowly building. Your students are getting agitated. They appear frustrated. Um, they're uh, get moving around a lot in their seat. You know, their facial expression is letting you know they are not happy right now. It could look like throwing things across the room, slamming their papers down, slamming books down, cursing. It could look like yelling out, um, hitting items like their locker or their desk, um, hitting people sometimes. We call those externalizing behaviors. And definitely um, any of these can be disruptive to the learning environment. But we also sometimes see uh, those behaviors where students are what I would call locked down, right? Those are the internalizing behaviors that look like you know, the student with their head down or what I call that slowdown, where really just no work is happening over a period of time. They just can't seem to get motivated to get that work done. Um, sometimes we have students with their heads down, they're sleeping in class or um, students that are just extremely sad, even crying in class. Whether you see students that have those acting out behaviors or students that are just absolutely shut down, there are lots of strategies we can use um, to support students, even if we don't know that student well. Uh, the first strategy that we definitely wanna use is to attempt to diffuse that situation before the behavior happens. So if you notice a student that's getting agitated, you know, going ahead and trying to reduce the stress of the moment can be powerful. Um, if you can figure out why that behavior is starting, you know, if it's frustration with the task, if it's frustration with other people, if there's too much noise in the room, you know, if I can identify why that behavior appears to be starting, and then I can diffuse the situation. Sometimes I can diffuse that situation by um, just going up to a student saying, you know, it, it looks like you're getting agitated. Can I help? What's happening? And listen to their concerns. Some students will be able to share those with you. Other students won't want to talk. Offering choices, uh, again, super powerful. And whether we're in academic tasks or we're looking at behaviors, giving students the option sometimes to, you know, take a walk out of the classroom, um, you know, take a walk around the hall and come back in five minutes, uh, go get a drink of water and come back. 
can be powerful. Offering students, you know, it looks like you just need a few minutes. You want to listen to your headphones for five minutes before you get started um, can be powerful for students. I like to remember, or remember and remind myself to go lightly, right? Um, rather than uh, sometimes tackling a situation head on, and I mean that figuratively, rather than jumping right in and saying to a student, you need to get on task and what are you doing? Rather than doing that, often providing gentle reminders of the expectations of the class are a better way to go. So I might say something like, all right, so we're five minutes into work time. So at this point, I'd expect everybody to have their name on their paper and be working on the first three problems. If you're stuck, um, if you'll raise your hand and let me know, I'd be happy to come over and help you. That general reminder is sometimes a better way to go than uh, directly approaching a student and um, you know commanding them to get started. Again, offering choices is a powerful motivator for a lot of students. So saying to a student, you know, by now, usually I'd expect you to have two problems done. Um, can I help you get started on this first one or are you ready to tackle that one by yourself? Would you like a calculator to get started? And then giving students space. After you've made a recommendation, then backing up, walking away, working with another student, and then circling back around to that student is often a great support. So the big idea here is that often, whether we're in reading, writing, math, or supporting students that are demonstrating behavior, offering choices is powerful. But we need to keep in mind that those have to be what we would call legitimate choices. So here's a non-example. Do what I say or you're going to be kicked out of this class forever, right? That's a non-example. It's not a legitimate choice. We don't have the power to make that statement. Um, and it's nothing we would want for any learner, no matter how frustrated or frustrating the situation is. You know, we want to get to a spot where students are able to learn. So we're going to only offer choices that are legitimate. So for example, saying, would you like to start that task on your own? Or do you want me to solve that first problem with you? That'd be a legitimate choice we can make. Asking students, you know, do you want to start that task in pen or pencil so you can erase it if you don't like your answer? Legitimate choice. You know, do you want to start this task now or would you rather work on your journal activity? You know, a different task um, is absolutely a legitimate offer. If you're looking to deepen your um, understanding of support you can provide for students, we have a whole host of great resources. The very first link is to our NKCES online training site. All of the trainings there are asynchronous, which means you can hop into those at any moment that you would like. And we have more than 70 trainings listed on the site now, many of them focused on supporting students with disabilities um, in the area of behavior. So feel free to jump in there and look around um, for any of the trainings you'd like to take. They're free. Uh, at the next three sites, Intervention Central, the CI3T Intervention Site, and Intensive Interventions, you'll find some excellent um, quick blogs and videos you can watch to um, walk you through some of the best evidence-based interventions we can use to support students. And at the final link, Wholehearted School Counseling will take you to her um, Instagram page, and she has lots of great visuals and reminders to support our students' social-emotional learning needs. So some free resources if you'd like to dive a little deeper. I'd also love to remind you that it's really important when you're supporting students to make sure that you come in refreshed and ready for the day. And in education, we talk a lot about this concept of self-care, you know, making sure that we take care of ourselves so that we can take care of our students. And um, a lot of times you hear that example about um, making sure you, you're pouring from a cup that is not empty, right? And um, if you're on an airplane you know, and we start having any problems, you wanna make sure you put that oxygen mask on yourself first so that you can take care and put oxygen masks on other people. So the same concept applies here. We wanna make sure that we come in refreshed and ready. And here are just a bunch of great tips that you might want to save for yourself to make sure that you come into each day ready to roll. 
the best recommendation that I ever got uh, when I started teaching was to make sure that I took 10 minutes every day for myself to make sure that I'm refreshed and ready to teach and then ready to come home and be with my family. And 10 minutes a day is manageable no matter how busy I get. So at least 10 minutes every day, take care of yourself um, so that you can take care of our students. Uh, in each district where you are acting as a substitute, um, we always know that you are willing to go that extra mile to support students. And we just wanted to take a minute to say thank you for being a substitute teacher. Um, it's a super important job to make sure that our students are supported and taken care of every day. If you run into any questions or are looking for supports and strategies, don't hesitate to reach out. I've got my email here as well as my Twitter handle, and I'm always happy to chat. Thanks so much for joining us today.